Good afternoon, listeners. Uh, this is Greg Silberman for CIOs and Bowties. Uh, our guest comes to us from the uh, West Coast, um, and this is this is going to be a, a real interesting one. I, just doing the research on this was uh, fascinating for me. So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our guest. Uh, on the line, we have Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Dr. de Grey is an English author and biomedical gerontologist. He's the chief science officer of the Sense Research Foundation. Sense stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, and that's something we'll, we'll speak about real soon, uh, and VP of New Technology Discovery at AgeX Therapeutics. He is editor-in-chief of the academ excuse me, academic journal Rejuvenation Research, author of the Mitochondria Free Radical Theory of Aging, and co-author of Ending Aging, a good book, and I, one that I was able to, to get through. He is known for his view that medical technology may enable human beings alive today not to die from age-related causes. So that's the, that's the fascinating thing here. De Grey is an international adjunct professor of the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, the American Aging Association, and the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. So if you guys were wondering about longevity, I think our guest today is exactly the right person on the line. He has been interviewed in recent years in a number of news sources, including CBS, 60 Minutes, the BBC, New York Times, Fortune, the Washington Post, TED, Popular Science, the Colbert Report, Time, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and the Joe Rogan Experience. Phew. I, I'm tired already, Dr. DeGray, so uh, welcome welcome to CIOs and Bowties. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Now, let me just get this out the way, because I heard there's actually a rumor going around that, that you yourself are already 156 years old. Can you, can you confirm or deny that for us, please? I, I think I may have said something like that on stage at TED in 2005, um, uh, but no, I'm actually only 56. <laughs> okay, so 100 years to go, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's get a little bit more serious. Serious then. Um, I noticed from from your resume, uh, you spent some time at a, at an organisation called the Methuselah Foundation, uh, and Methuselah, as you are well aware, uh, is is um, the fable goes, the belief, whatever you want to call it, believe it or not, um, was a gentleman who lived to 969 years old. Um, and so, my first question for you here is. Um, is a shorter lifespan, this, this theory that, you know, we should only live to under 100 years, is that actually a newer phenomenon or have we always never lived very long? I'm completely certain that we have never lived very long. That, in fact, um, whatever the um, origin of the biblical ages that we see, um, you know, the, it, the, w that story is not actually biologically correct. At the moment, we are living a little bit longer than people have lived before. Obviously, average lifespans are a lot longer than before because we are so so much so many fewer people are dying early in life from infections. But maximum lifespan has also gone up a little bit, um, just as a result of better nutrition, better prosperity, all that kind of thing. However, um, what we can certainly say is that in the absence of the medicines that people like myself are in the process of developing, uh, there is a natural limit to how long people can live. That limit will only be transcended by medicines that don't yet exist. Okay. All right. So that, that brings us to our, our first question, which I know listeners will be uh, confused by. So define for us what this term senescence means. Is senescence essentially the, the root of aging? And I know you use a great um, com comparison between physics and biology. So I wonder if you could just mix that all in for our listeners. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I mean, terminology in this whole field is an enormous minefield. Uh, people, you know, ha there's just so much baggage, so many connotations around. So we have to be very, very careful. Now, the word senescence is often used by people who study the biology of aging just in order to uh, distinguish the undesirable aspects of aging, the aspects mm -hmm. of aging that are associated with failing health, as opposed to the good things like, you know, becoming more knowledgeable and so on. Um, but really, you know, for uh, practical, you know, non-specialist purposes, 
there's no real difference between senescent and aging. Senescence is simply what most people understand by the word aging in the first place. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, the issue of physics, uh, yeah, this is an interesting thing. So a lot of people, even if we say, okay, there's no difference between senescence and aging, uh, still, um, they get confused about what aging really is. Mm -hmm. If you ask 10 people what aging is, you'll get 10 different answers. It's not good. I mean, it, it, and it's pretty surprising, really, if you think about it, because let's face it, you know, aging has been the predominant preoccupation of humanity since the beginning of civilization. You would have kind of expected that we would have figured out what it is uh, and, and come to an agreed definition. Um, but yeah, basically, aging is, you, you, one often oversimplifies it. A lot of people say aging is the decline in health, both mental and physical health, of course, um, that happens late in life. And then other people will say, well, it's the process that goes on throughout life that gives rise to the um, eventual uh, decline in health. Now, actually, both of those definitions are oversimplistic. The correct, the only really useful way to define aging is as the combination of both of those things. And the reason that's important is because it helps us to delineate what kind of ways we might use to go about doing something about it and keeping people from not getting sick when they get old. Um, so if we look at, for example, simple machines like cars, we can see that it's possible to keep a car going just as well as when it was built for as long as we like. Now, that's why there are vintage cars, 100-year-old cars. Um, it, they were not designed to last that long. They were designed to last maybe 10, a year, 10 years or 15 at the outside. Um, what we could do is wait until the rust accumulates and the doors fall off and then put the doors back on and, you know, 10 minutes later the doors are going to fall off again. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not very effective. Another thing we could do is somehow like, keep the car in the garage and not have it actually do what a car is for, uh, you know, which case it won't get dusty in the first place, but it won't really be a car in the meaningful sense of the word. So neither of those alternatives makes any sense. But we have this other alternative, which is kind of the sweet spot between the two. Namely, we do the car, we, we, we take the car out on the road and it gets, you know, rust happens, but we preemptively periodically remove the rust, you know, before it gets to the point where the doors fall off. And of course, not just the rust, also everything else that goes wrong, like, you know, the stuff accumulating in the oil and so on. So that's what it is really, comprehensive preventative maintenance. And the business about physics versus biology arises from that. The body, the human body is a machine. It's a ridiculously, insanely, you know, incomprehensibly complicated machine. Mm -hmm. Still a machine, and that means that the, you know, the the the, the 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 process of deciding how to keep it going, how to stop it from declining in function, is ultimately the same process as deciding how to do it for a simple machine like a car. So this is really the innovation that I'm mainly known for. I was the first person to introduce twenty years ago now the idea that we shouldn't be doing just geriatric medicine, um, which is essentially the equivalent of waiting for the doors to fall off. Mm -hmm. But we also should not be doing the equivalent of keeping the car in the garage. In other words, trying to slow down the rate at which damage occurs in the first place, you know, like uh, the equivalent of rust, uh, which is basically the paradigm that the field of the biology of aging, the gerontology field, had been pursuing for the previous mm -hmm. century. Okay. I said, hang on, actually, we've got this sweet spot in the middle where we can let damage happen, and we're going mean, to, it's just like it's going to happen, there's no way we can stop it from happening. Um, but then we repair the damage periodically, but before someone actually gets sick. And I was able to argue that we could actually do this comprehensively, or at least sufficiently comprehensively to achieve the objective of postponing the health problems of late life. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you've, you've opened the door to a lot of my follow on questions, which is great. Uh, but we're going to stay with some, some definitions for now. Uh, my understanding is a lot of the research that's undergoing on now 
is um, you know go only going to come to its fruition in in a number of years time. How many many years? Well, we can debate that. Um, but but again, a lot of these um, how do you call it? Like maintaining the rust door uh, type technologies is still a little ways from us now. It's not available right now. But you've coined a term which I really like, and maybe you can explain it to us a bit more. And the term is longevity escape velocity. Um, maybe you can tell us, our, our listeners, what you mean by that. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, yes, you're quite right. The body accumulates a wide variety of different types of damage. And that means that we need to develop a wide variety of different therapies to repair and eliminate that damage. Um, the good news is that it's not a completely unmanageable number because we can classify the, um, the type of damage into a manageable number of categories. It's just seven categories I normally talk about. Mm -hmm. And for each category, there is one generic type of repair, which may vary a little bit in the details from one example within the category to another, but only in the details. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tractable thing. Okay. But yes, the, um, you know, some examples of damage within each category are more difficult to repair than others, just more inaccessible in some way. So we have no realistic chance of being able to repair 100% of the damage that the body does to itself throughout life anytime soon. There are just going to be you know, really difficult types of damage. However, we don't need to get to that point in order to give ourselves indefinite health. And the reason we don't is because of this thing that you've just mentioned, longevity escape velocity. If we were to get to a point that we could postpone the health problems of late life by, let's say, 20 or 30 years, but only by that amount, because the therapies were not 100% comprehensive, then that's obviously really good in, in itself. You know, that's a lot of healthy life that people are going to enjoy. But more than that, we have essentially bought ourselves time. And I don't just mean we've bought the general, the, 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 you know, the general public time. I mean, we've bought researchers time. Mm -hmm. if, people, if people get, let's say they're 60 years old and they come in for these therapies and they get rejuvenated, they get that they're, that they're damage is largely repaired, but not completely 100%, then they may come back when they're, let's say, 90, and they'll be biologically 60 again. They'll have accumulated to the point where the difficult damage that the therapies don't work on is, you know, has reached the same level that the total amount of damage had already reached at the age of 60, right? Mm -hmm. And, of course, at that point, the therapies are just not going to help because, by definition, the therapies do not work right. on, the th on the stuff they don't work on. However... That's 30 years of research that's been going on in the meantime, which will have figured out how to repair some proportion of the difficult damage. So the people who are age 90 will not actually get the same therapies. They will get, you know, Sense 2.0. Um, and they will thereby, have, they will indeed be able to be re-rejuvenated mm -hmm. so that they um, won't be biologically 60 for the third time until they're, let's say, 150 and so on. So basically the idea is, can we stay one step ahead of the problem? And the term longevity escape velocity that I coined is simply the minimum rate at which the research community needs to improve the comprehensiveness of the therapies in order to do that, in order to stay one step ahead of the problem and keep people, people's amount of damage below the threshold level that makes them sick. Okay. Got it. So I, I would equate it to uh, very inaccurately to say the kind of the Moore's law as it applies to um, longevity and rejuvenation. Not, well, not that, exactly. Yes, not, not exactly. And in mm. fact, it's worth my taking a moment to explain, okay. why the, explain what the difference is, because this is something that often confuses people. So, of course, there is this term of singularity, which is often used to describe the idea of computers becoming uh, more and more powerful and more and more intelligent at an exponentially increasing rate and eventually reaching a point where, um, you know, we just don't, we just can't see beyond it. Now, it's all about accelerating change there. 
But the case of longevity escape velocity is not accelerating change. Actually, the rate at which scientists will need to improve the therapies actually slows down over time because the residual amount of damage that the therapies at a given point cannot yet fix is going to be less and less. And therefore, it's going to take longer and longer for that residual ultra difficult damage to reach the point that is pathogenic. And that's extremely comforting because it's, you know, it's a fair thing. It's a fair, fair concern that we don't know how rapidly researchers are going to do their, do mm-hmm. their job. Therefore, you know, it's very important in, in terms of, um, you know, evaluating the chances that we will reach and then maintain longevity escape velocity to take into account the fact that we don't have to keep going faster and faster and faster. Okay. All right. I, I accept that. That actually opens the door nicely to a quick discussion about the, the seven pillars um, of, let me just read this, types of molecular and cellular damage that are caused by essential metabolic process, process, processes. Um, maybe you can just sketch out for us really at a high level what these seven pillars are. And, and my assumption at this point is there's, you know, seven areas of um, damage that occurs through aging, which you seek to regenerate and, and fix. So maybe you can just run us through those at a high level, please, Doctor. Sure, yes, absolutely. And let me repeat briefly something that I mentioned a moment ago, that I'm in no way saying that there are only seven types of damage. What I'm saying is that the many, many types of damage that occur can be classified into seven mm-hmm. categories, right. which are corresponding to a particular type of therapy. Got it. And that's what's important. Okay. okay. So, um, what, are the, what, are, what are these seven categories? Well, first one is, very simple to describe, cell loss, loss of cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And of course, the way to repair that damage, to restore things to how they were, is to put new cells in, and that's what stem cell therapy is. Then the second one is having too many cells rather than too few, and in particular, having too many cells of a bad sort, so um, there's a very obvious way in which that can happen, namely when cells are dividing more than they are supposed to. Mm-hmm. That, of course, is more or less the definition of cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, there are various approaches to dealing with cancer. We have been pursuing very aggressively an approach that involves attacking the telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes, and making sure that the cancer cell is not able to continue to extend the telomeres. Um, And, of course, we're also very interested in what's called cancer immunotherapy, stimulating the immune system to be better than normal at getting rid of um, cancer cells. So that's a big area. Uh, Then there's another way in which we can have too many cells. And this is historically something that's been rather neglected, though it's quite high profile now. The uh, way you can get this is by cells not necessarily dividing too much, but instead actually um, just not dying when they should. Hmm. Cells often get into a state where it's necessary for them to die. And normally they kind of know this and they do it, they commit suicide. And sometimes when they don't commit suicide, the immune system gets rid of them. And so that's fine. But there are some kinds of cases where neither of those things happen. The cells just accumulate and they're bad for you. They, especially they secrete molecules that damage their their neighbors. so uh, a, big, a big subset of this are what's called senescent cells. Mm-hmm. And this is a word that's probably not very, um, you know, it's a term that's probably not very descriptive, so, but, they're, but nah, we, it is what it is. Um, at any rate, the um, yeah, senescent cells are now um, the target of some drugs that really work, that actually selectively kill them. And these are in clinical trials already. Um, so that's really why it's a much more high profile area than it has historically been. Okay, so that's three. Um, and all of the things I've mentioned so far involve the number of cells. The first thing is too few, mm-hmm. the other two mm-hmm. are too many. Everything else is not at the cellular level, it's at the molecular level. And that again divides into two subsets. There are two types of damage that happen inside cells and two other types that happen in the spaces between cells, outside of the cell. So inside cells, First one is mutations in a very important part of the cell called the mitochondria. The mitochondria are machines inside the cell that perform the chemistry of breathing. So in other words, they chemically combine oxygen with nutrients 
in order to extract energy from the nutrients that is then used for okay. um, all manner of purposes. And the problem is that mitochondria have their own DNA. They're the only part of the cell where there's DNA other than the regular chromosome, the nucleus. And the mitochondria is an extraordinarily bad place for DNA to be because it's, um, you know, it's, it's this chemistry that I described of breathing is really hairy and it creates toxins. It creates free radicals which damage DNA. So the DNA in the mitochondria accumulates mutations far, far faster than anything in the nucleus. And that's really bad. These, the genes, the, there's only 13 proteins that are encoded by that DNA, but still, those are essential proteins. So um, we need to fix that. And the way that we've been pursuing is by putting backup copies of that DNA in the nucleus, modified in such a way that the DNA still does its thing, um, even though it's in the wrong place. It's really an, a really ambitious and difficult thing to do, but we are far further ahead than anyone ever believed we could be, um, mm. even a few years ago. So that's all going nicely. The other type of damage that is inside the cell is much easier to describe than to understand. It's simply waste products. The body, you know, the, it, every cell makes byproducts of its chemical reactions all the time, lots and lots of them. And every byproduct that is created at a rapid rate, of course, the cell has to figure out a way to deal with it because otherwise it will be killed by just having too much garbage. And there are two ways of dealing with it. Either you can destroy the stuff or you can excrete it. Fine. However, the problem is that there are a few types of garbage that are created only very, very, very slowly. And that's problematic because if something is created slowly, it doesn't become a problem until we're old. Mm. And if something isn't a problem until we're old, then evolution doesn't care about it. Because evolution only cares right. about transmission of genetic information and by the time we're old we've already had our kids and so on and so forth so so we have to augment the machinery for getting rid of garbage to get rid of these slowly accumulating types of garbage and we've been doing that in a variety of ways mostly by identifying bacterial enzymes that are able to actually chop up and break down the kinds of garbage that we humans cannot naturally break down all right so there's only two left now, there are two things left, and as I mentioned, they are outside the cell. So the first one is, again, garbage. Garbage accumulates outside the cell as well. But the good news here is that the garbage outside the cell is intrinsically much easier to break down than the garbage inside the cell. Garbage outside the cell only accumulates at all because the machinery that we naturally have to break down garbage outside the cell just is really primitive and not very good. And therefore, it's sufficient to just cause cells to engulf this stuff. If you can get a cell to internalize this garbage, mm -hmm. then it gets to be exposed to the machinery for mm -hmm. breaking stuff down right. that naturally exists inside the cell. And that works. So the, the, the garbage is toast very quickly. Um, and that's been very successful. Essentially, the way one does this is by stimulating the immune system, by vaccinating against the garbage. And, We've got pretty good at that now. Um, and the final one is, again, as I said, outside the cell. This time it is a physical problem. A number of our tissues, they need to be elastic in order to do their job. They need to be able to stretch. And that elasticity arises from the molecular structure of the tissue, in particular, this lattice of proteins called the extracellular matrix. That lattice becomes stiffer and stiffer over time because it undergoes chemical reactions with stuff in the, in the bloodstream, especially with sugar. And so again, the molecular nature of this damage is, um, is well understood, but we've got to do something about it. Essentially, what we have to do is identify drugs or enzymes that can restore the structure to how it was by essentially breaking the new chemical bonds that are accumulating undesirably. Mm -hmm. And again, we've had great success there. Um, first of all, in terms of actually identifying drugs, but also especially in terms of, again, identifying um, enzymes from bacteria and other species that have the right activity. Okay. But the great thing is that most of these things that I've just described to you are already far enough along that we at Sense Research Foundation don't even work on them anymore because we've been able to spin them out as startup companies. That is really our business model these days. We we are very keen to, to, to get the private sector involved as quickly as possible, 
largely because it just means the project gets more money. You know, yeah. there's lots of people out there who are visionary and who, you know, have deep pockets, but at the end of the day, they really don't like giving money away. And so getting them to provide money philanthropically to the nonprofit is tricky. And therefore, okay. as soon as something gets to the point where an investor can like join the dots and see that they can actually move things forward far enough along to make a profit eventually, then, you know, that's what we do. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we'll definitely get to the investment side. That is what is of the, probably the greatest, well, uh, equally great interest to our listeners who are predominantly uh, wealthy individuals, family offices and the like, but, but we'll get there uh, methodically if that's okay. Uh, yeah. Just the last point on the, on uh, number seven, pillar number seven, I'm just curious, a total novice question, but um, you know, the, the characterization of aging is, is a person who, is, becomes generally less mobile um, overall. And is, is that in any way tied to this, this uh, rigidity of, uh, gosh, I can't even remember the, 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 the right. terms that you use. Yeah, stiffening. Um, yeah, not actually all that strongly. No, so okay. The things that really matter as a result of this stiffening are number one, hypertension. It's a big contributor to the rise in blood pressure with age because the major arteries need to be elastic in order to do their job mm -hmm. to buffer the um, circulation. Um, the other thing is cosmetic, uh, wrinkling, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the aging of the skin yeah. is very strongly caused by the loss of elasticity of the lower layer of the skin. Uh, okay. um, and actually presbyopia as well, um, the inability to see things close up. That's again the same process. It's going on in the lens of the eye. So these are the kinds of things. Okay. The, the loss of, of, um, su uh, of suppleness and mobility that you're talking about is mainly a result of things going bad in the joints. And that's caused by a combination, actually, of the things I described. We lose mm -hmm. cells. The cells become senescent. Uh, the collagen and uh, ca the cartilage becomes um, degraded, mainly broken up because it's not recycled rapidly enough because of the problems with the cells. Um, so it's not really an elasticity problem. Um, it's more the other ones. Accumulation. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. Thanks for setting up the groundwork and we're going to get, uh, we're going to take a short break now. Uh, when, when we come back with uh, Dr. DeGray, we're going to get a little bit more technical and, um, and find out exactly how, uh, how this all uh, gets put, put, to, put together in practice. So bear with us. We'll be right back.